we at mkr invencia division orofer fcm is our core brand and epitome of quality and success mkr has helped more than 60 lakhs indian patients to rapidly correct iron deficiency anemia furthermore we are taking a pledge for making india iron strong today mkr team is honor and thankful to ifs tamil nadu and ifs pondicherry for giving us opportunity to host this scientific webinar and be a partner for this wonderful academic educational initiative now may i take this opportunity to introduce uh, today's expert and uh, of uh, ifs tamil nadu uh, i welcome and uh, uh that's a uh, doctor name is dr surveen dr chitra and dr priya kanan uh, today mkr is a uh, team is honor to have a stream speaker to discuss about the uh, scientific uh, scientific educational uh, discussion just i'm sharing cvs <coughs> first i would like to introduce dr uh, chitra she is a secretary ifs just yeah dr chitra is a, she is a secretary ifs chapter uh, pondicherry and next uh, dr priya kanan she is a joint secretary of tamil nadu chapter of ifs then i would like to introduce dr indumathi joy she is a ec member ifs chapter tamil nadu yeah dr chitra o to you doctor please thank you thank you mr nakul for the kind introduction uh, i welcome everyone on behalf of ifs chapter tamil nadu and ifs chapter pondicherry welcoming you on this research honoring skills web series so as our motto of our ifs ifs indian fertility society of delhi we have planning to do hold an a series of webinar on this which is become a important aspect in research so for this i really like to who really motivates us inspires us is with us dr uh, surveen ma'am she is a secretary general of indian fertility society thank you so much ma'am for uh, really motivating us and inspiring us i will request you to pray, tell a few words ma'am <coughs> thank you chitra and it is so heartening to see that we are following the right path of research of quality academics because there are n number of things happening everybody wanting to project themselves but the most important thing is that you need quality in all these things and that is what we at ifs are trying to do is to introduce quality into our research and academics and uh, one feels really proud uh, seeing that uh, you know accomplished people like you priya everybody here the speakers are uh, you know taking this forward because uh, you are the torch bearers and if you take it forward i'm sure everybody follows so thank you so much uh, for being a part of ifs for following what we believe in and for taking it forward thank you so much ma'am thank you for your inspiring words i hope you be with us and quite inspire us throughout that session so uh, we like to request today we have a good two experts who are expert in this field of uh, field of research skills and methodology uh, dr prashant ganeshan and dr rajeshwari so first we request uh, dr rajeshwari to give a talk uh, rajeshwari you can put the side dr rajeshwari is assistant professor in the department of biostatistics uh, uh, in uh, jipma and uh, she has did her uh, bsc and ms in biostatistics and to she is really a gold medalist in her bsc and also a second rank in ms in biostatistics and she has got a best student award in 2004 she has lot of uh, publications to her credit and she has also guided many of the phd scholars and she has been invited speaker in many national international conference so over to rajeshwari uh, thank you ma'am thank you for your uh, introduction um, first of all i would like to thank uh, uh, the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity special thanks to dr chitra ma'am and dr gubera sir uh, and uh, shall i share my screen okay doctor you can proceed yes okay can you see my screen yes visible okay you can uh, put it in slide show oh, yes ma'am uh, now it is visible ma'am not it yeah no not it not it slide show you can no your, your slides are visible but if you can put it the overall screen no slide show 
Uh, yeah, it is in the overall screen only, ma'am. Oh, yes. Mm. Click the oh. right icon, uh, which is like a cup at the bottom, next to the four dots. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Icon, click that. Next to that, one or two percent. Okay, I I couldn't see this. Okay, one minute. Oh, because you are in an overview, na? Mm, yes, ma'am. Mm. Uh, again, you go back to your uh, this ma'am mode and. Uh, then you yes, yes. I am putting it in the slideshow mode only. Now it is in the slideshow, ma'am. Uh, no, no, it da. isn't. Okay. Can you uh, can you stop sharing and try sharing again? Yes, ma'am. Mm. Madam, press F five, madam. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Mm. Ma'am, now it is in slideshow mode. No, no you can go to the slideshow on top. I think for her it is uh, it is showing as a full screen. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. For her it's showing as a full screen. Ah, yes, sir. No, no, she clicked on it, but it still didn't go through. Yeah, I clicked it. Yeah, I clicked it. Now it is in slideshow mode. No, for no. her it is uh, for slideshow. For me, it is full screen. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Do one thing, uh, doctor. Uh, yes, doctor. First, you need to means put in slideshow mode, and then okay. uh, then share you that slide. Okay. Okay. One minute. Can you see, ma'am? We can't see any screen now. Okay. You're showing the status. Any screen. of your slides? Yeah. Can you can you share it by email to Mr. Nakul and he can? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, share it for you. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I can. I'm sharing can you my mail ID to. Okay. Yeah, you may. Uh, or uh, yeah, you can mail to me also on copy. Yeah, you can mail to Dr. Chitra also. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You have my email ID, na? You can mail it to me. Dr. Rajeshwari, I have shared my mail ID. You can. Mm, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Have you got it, Chitra? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. One minute, I will send. I have sent to both uh, Dr. Nakul and uh, Dr. Chitra. Just checking. Yeah, I am searching. Okay, I haven't got it yet. Got it? Please share it then. Nakul, you got it? I have not yet received not it. Noted, noted, noted. I will try once last time. Yeah. You try by being my weekend uh, also. Okay. You can try F5 also, control F5. Uh, is it now in the share no. lightroom? No. Okay. But, uh, and I think uh, it's okay if you can just at least uh, proceed with the uh, yeah. with the talk because okay. we are running out of time. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, sorry for the inconvenience, but for no, me, it is uh, a yeah. that's okay. Your, uh, slide. Shall I try? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, yes, I yes. received. Please uh, minimize. Stop your share screen. Thanks. Have you got it? Yes, I received. Okay, great. Lovely. Visible? Please go ahead, Doctor Rajeshri. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Rajeshri, one request: Whenever you means you want to proceed in another slide, next slide, to please tell me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Good evening, uh, everyone who is on the online also. Uh, today, uh, my session is on overview of design, conduct, and analysis of clinical trials. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my objectives in this session will be. I'll be talking about what is a clinical trial. What are the various study designs? Mainly, I was uh, I wanted to concentrate on the study designs in the phase three trials. Uh, how randomization and blinding is uh, implemented, and why it is uh, very important in the clinical trials. And what are the different types of outcomes we'll be looking at, and how we can analyze what are the different statistical tests to analyze the outcomes of a clinical trial. Uh, this is what my uh, objective is. To start with a clinical trial, it is a prospective study. So always, uh, whenever we talk about a clinical trial, it is going to be a prospective study. And mainly we are looking at the effects and value of intervention and particularly in the human beings. So preclinical trials uh, usually happen with animals. But here we are concerned about the human beings. So when I use the word intervention, so mm. there are different types of intervention. Uh, next slide, please. Interventions, preventive or uh, nutritional, maternal and neonatal interventions, or sometimes it is not necessary, always it is going to be a surgical intervention or a radiation uh, methodology intervention. So it can be an educational intervention also. So with this basic idea of interventions, we will move to the different phases of clinical trials. Why these clinical trials are conducted in different phases are the main motto of uh, clinical trials are do not harm, do not harm, there should not be any harm. So that is the basic motto in all the medical research and specifically in clinical trials also. So this is always conducted in phases. So when we start with phase one, before phase one, we have a basic idea of, from the preclinical trials, that is from laboratory experiments conducted on animals. So with that basic information only, we'll be starting with the uh, other consecutive uh, phases of the clinical trials. So when we start with phase one, so usually in the drug development uh, trials, phase one is very important to identify the maximum tolerated dose. That is main motto of the all these trials will be safety and efficacy. Primary is safety and then we will be looking for the efficacy of the drug. So here, uh, previous slides please. Previous slide, please, sir. Okay. Now the phases. Uh, so we have the phase one. When we have an uh, idea from about the drug in the phase one, I can move to the phase two, where I need to look for the preliminary estimator about the new drug it has been developed or uh, feasibility. Mainly in the phase two, we are not looking at whether the drug is efficacy, efficient or not. We will be looking at whether I can move to a phase three trial that is a larger trial. What is the feasibility? Whether I will be able to recruit the subjects. This information will be obtained in phase two. And with this basic idea, we will be moved to the phase three where large number of uh, samples or a large number of subjects will be included. And here we will be looking at the efficacy of the drug and in the phase four is the post marketing that is once the drug is into the market after getting the proper license from the regulatory authorities it will be in the market but it will be monitored continuously for the safety and efficacy and for the long term side effects uh, this is the overview of the phase one to phase four trial sometimes we will be having phase two uh, next slide please so, 
this basically i am looking at what are all the various designs used in the phase 3 clinical trials so uh, phase 1 trials and phase 2 trials all these phases we cannot use the same design phase 1 and phase 2 specifically we have some designs but now i am going to discuss on mainly phase 3 designs because most of the clinical trials uh, the clinicians who are going to be involved is phase 3 trials only so here uh, the most commonly used is the parallel arm design where each group of subject receives only one intervention and uh, most of the times this parallel arm design is used when the treatment has a long lasting effect and there is outcome we are looking at as a prevention or a cure this is where the parallel arm design is used uh, next slide please the crossover trials uh, the parallel arm we will be having two groups of people whereas in crossover trials when you have a rare condition or uh, the people the sample size when i can consider only a small sample size for my trial i can even go for the crossover trial but the outcome what you are looking at it should not be a cure or recover from the disease whenever the disease is a chronic condition we can con we can look for the uh, reduction in the symptoms it is not a specific cure so here in the process group 1 and group 2 that is subject the order of giving the intervention it is not intervention a and intervention b is given here the order of the intervention which intervention is given first is the is our concern so when i give the first drug after a particular period only i can start giving the second drug for the subject so in between the wash out period that is a sufficiently long wash out period which can remove the effect of the carry over effect of the first treatment also should be taken care when you are using a crossover trial next slide please and the split person trials mostly uh, it is not commonly used to trial Uh, sometimes people will prefer the split person trials sometimes the same intervention whereas in the crossover trial the intervention is not given at the same time to the same subject whereas in the split person trial the intervention can be given at the same time and it is efficacious in uh, so that we can eliminate all the other uh, biases that can uh, that can happen that is Uh, we can compromise the other effects which can uh, modify the outcome so that can be eliminated when you are using the split person trials design next slide please and the factorial trial till the whatever i have discussed a specific one intervention we are looking at with comparing to a placebo or a control whereas in factorial trial i can have answer for two or more research question with one trial itself in the sense so in this example i have mentioned folic acid multivitamins so one group will receive both folic acid and multivitamins and one group will does not receive both folic acid and multivitamins so we are looking all these four combinations that is folic acid present multivitamin absent multivitamin present folic acid absent so i'll be able to answer all these questions using a single trial so this is by applying the factorial trial and uh, the cluster randomized trial when i was not able to randomize the subjects individually that is i cannot allocate the treatment individually and it is specific to your entire community or group wise suppose if you are creating a awareness program or giving an educational intervention among the medical practitioners we can give them in the group that is unit 1 for a specific unit one intervention for a specific unit other intervention so whenever the treatment or the intervention cannot be given individually we can prefer the cluster randomized side so my idea is to sensitize what are all the various study designs that can that is most commonly used in the phase 3 trials uh, can i move to the next slide okay so this is the most uh, famous words used in the trials that is superiority trial equivalence and non inferiority trial when i can use this uh, superiority trial suppose i want to compare a new treatment with a standard treatment or a placebo here i have taken a as a new treatment and b as the standard treatment superiority trials will be conducted when i want to show that the new treatment is more effective than the standard treatment 
so i have highlighted the words more effective so how much effective the clinician should decide based on a specific margin similarly equivalence a has a similar effect to b so similar effect so here i am trying to show both are equal and a non inferiority that is a is not less effective than b here also i will i need to quantify how much it is not less effective or if it is superiority how much it is more effective so in both superiority and non inferiority the clinician should decide a margin a non inferiority margin or superiority margin to come up with a conclusion whether the hypothesis is met or not can i move to the next one okay so for, for all these uh, designs to apply i need to specifically go with the randomization technique uh, people will get confused whether this allocation concealment and blinding is same or not but sequence generation we have lot of packages to generate a random sequence sequence generation along with allocation concealment together is called a randomization by this process we are ensuring that each participant has the same chance being assigned to either intervention or control there are different types of intervention uh, that is randomization technique simple randomization block randomization and stratified randomization technique simple randomization is simply like a, a tossing a coin i can assign the subject but the problem is i won't be getting equal number of subjects in the both arms that is intervention and the placebo so for this we can move for the block randomization technique uh, next slide please in the block randomization technique we will be having blocks to ensure that at any point of time if the trial is stopped because of any adverse effect if if you are planning for any interim analysis based on that if you are stopping the trial we can ensure that equal number of subjects are allocated to both the intervention and the placebo group next slide please if specific a uh, clinical parameter uh, here i have considered gender as a, my strata suppose some clinical parameter like bmi a confounders which can affect your outcome you can use a stratified block randomization technique considering those confounding variables as a strata and uh, for each strata for males separately a randomization sequence and for females a separately a randomization sequence so how many strata you are going to consider based on that the number of randomization sequence should be generated and allocation concealment using the snows technique sequentially numbered opaque uh, covers should be used to maintain the allocation concealment next slide please okay this is the blinding i have given up a, a single picture here showing that different types of blinding that is single blinding double blinding triple blinding so nobody is blinded patient knows and the uh, staff or the investigator who is uh, principal investigator also know what is the uh, treatment the subject is getting that is a open trial and if the patient is blinded to avoid uh, the psychological feelings of the patient that a new regimen is given then only i will get cure to avoid all those things so if the patient is blinded i can mention as a single blinded study and if both the patient and the investigator is blinded that is a double blinded study and if you want to further blind the statistician who is going to analyze your data also that is the triple blinded study so blinding uh, in many uh, clinical trials blinding may not be applicable but if, if uh, when i want to say it is a proper uh, clinical trial then i should say the randomization and blinding is followed then only i can say it is a valid clinical trial next slide please next slide please yes. doctor okay thank you so here uh, i was talking about the designs uh, what are all the designs it is used and what is the uh, how randomization and blinding is been applied and what are the different types of outcomes so i i think i am taking more time uh, here uh, different types of outcomes mainly we will be talking about three outcomes one is counting people either your data may be a binary that is uh, Yes or no type, or a categorical data that is a gravida, uh, medical surgical comorbidities, cervical uh, cervical circulation, labor onset, mode of delivery. So mode of delivery uh, can be different, uh, C section, normal, or among the itself you will be having multiple categories. You will be subdividing it. So it either it can be a binary or categorical data which we will obtain by counting the people. 
that is either a frequency or proportion to represent this data and taking measurements on people like what is their age it is a measurement gestational age years of infertility these are all continuous data so we have summary measures to represent this continuous measurement that is i am taking a measurement either using any of this measurement and the last one is measures based on time to event data that is if i am concerned about i am not interested in uh, at, uh, whether the delivery happened or not or the mode of delivery i am looking at what is the time taken to delivery so if i am interested in the time taken also then my outcome is time to event data so these measurements that is counting people measurement and time to event data in statistical part we have different way of summarizing these measurements and different statistical test to analyze this data can you move to the next slide please okay so as i told earlier analysis of phase one studies uh, each study the design is different what design i am going to apply and how i am going to analyze each of this outcome that is also different it is not always i am going to apply independent student status for a phase one study or a phase two study so different statistical way is there to analyze each of these uh, phases here phase one studies we are looking at the mainly we are looking at what is about the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics if it is going to be a therapeutic trial and in that case i am interested in the maximum tolerated dose so i will be looking at the pharmacokinetics part can you move to the next slide so here i will be analyzing the data looking at what is the highest concentration level time at which highest concentration occurs terminal half life clearance uh, the c max t max values this is what my interest i am not looking at the efficacy of the drug i am just trying to look at the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the trial uh, next slide please so this is an article i have quoted here where they have looked at uh, how rapidly this nac is metabolized so here they looked at the outcome measures as nac volume distribution concentration total body clearance and placental transfer ratio here they are not looking at what is the uh, efficacy whether the drug is effective or not they are trying to understand the pharmacokinetic and the dynamics of it so analysis of phase 2 studies sometimes uh, it is not necessary i should have a control group in phase 2 studies i can have a single uh, single arm study or i can have a control group also if it is a single arm i my summary measure whatever i am looking at it should be represented with the uh, if it is a proportion what is the 95% confidence interval of the proportion suppose if you are looking at a mean and the outcome should be reported with the 95% confidence interval can i move to the next one okay so this is uh, a phase 2 trial study of nicotinamide in early onset preeclampsia here the outcome measure what they are looking is change in mean arterial blood pressure so what is the proportion of women with maternal abdominal tenderness so they have only one group of people among them they are going to report a single mean and a single proportion and it will be reported with the 95 percentage confidence interval and in for the analysis of phase 3 trials uh, next slide please i need to concern about whether i am going to do an intention to treat analysis or per protocol analysis so here i will start <coughs> uh, using this term because uh, when we have uh, more than one group i need to decide how i am going to analyze intention to treat is the subjects who is randomized as per the randomization the analysis is done suppose that after randomization the subject is treated to uh, allocated to intervention and in case if the subject is not undergoing intervention is moved to placebo also during analysis i will consider that subject has undergone an intervention that is as per randomization i am going to analyze the data that is intention to treat per protocol is analysis includes subjects who took their allocated treatment whatever treatment they have taken based on that i am going to take the Uh, do the analysis that is per protocol analysis so when you are going to start uh, the analysis of your clinical trials you are going to decide whether you are going to perform intention to treat or per protocol analysis next slide please okay so as i have told the summary measures 
continuous data, if it is uh, two groups, uh, I can compare using independent student status or a categorical data using a chi-square artificial sector test. Other than that, we have number needed to treat and number needed to form as a summary measure from the analysis of phase two studies or uh, from the phase three studies also. Can I move to the next one? Okay. So this multiple analysis of phase three studies, mainly I want to talk about this composite outcome measures. Sometimes what happened, uh, particular specific outcome, if we look at, it is very difficult to get those many number of outcomes, uh, specific outcome if I'm looking at. Or when I consider a composite outcome measure, it will help such that you can take a small number of sample when the cost is very important in performing a particular trial. So the sample size will be reduced based on the composite outcome measure, but you will be able to answer many questions based on this composite outcome measure. Here we won't consider the outcome A and outcome B and outcome C. Here we will consider A or B or C as the final outcome. So the sample size can be reduced. This is mostly preferred when uh, you are looking at a cost effective trial. Next uh, slide, please. Okay. Same summary measures and the uh, number needed to treat and number needed to harm as a analysis of phase three studies also. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so I have only two more slides. I will complete with that. So when we talk about clinical trials, we should talk about the interim analysis. That is, in most of the trials, always the analysis will be done at the end of the study. But in case, if you are looking at the outcome as a uh, severe adverse effect or severe uh, outcome can happen because of the intervention, there should be a monitoring committee. Usually we will talk about the data and safety monitoring board. There should be a committee constituting the experts, minimum of three people that should be present and uh, experts should be there and uh, including a statistician to ensure that uh, we are not crossing the stopping rule. So we should specify if I want to analyze my trial before the end of the trial itself and what is the stopping rule. Suppose what percentage of people suffering the adverse effects, I am going to stop the trial. All these should be planned before start of the trial. Stopping rule should be specified and how many interim analysis I am going to do. Suppose the follow up period is for one year. So I can stop that. Uh, I can make the interim analysis like after recruiting the 25 percentage of the subjects or 50 percentage of the subjects or after recruiting, uh, looking at 50, per, uh, 50 percentage of the subjects achieve their outcome based on specific criteria, I need to fix a stopping rule. And uh, when you incorporate interim analysis, uh, subsequent alpha adjustment for sample size estimation and in the analysis plan should also be carried out. So when you include interim analysis, interim analysis is preferred uh, to check the efficacy and safety of the treatment between the groups at any point in the ongoing trial and ensure the safety for the participants. Can you move to the next slide, please? Oh, next slide, please. Okay. So to summarize this, the decision to conduct larger confirmatory trials should depend on several factors. Always the safety is first, then efficacy and feasibility. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the confidence intervals and p-values must be calculated for any exercise to interpret the data. So overall, I wanted to say whenever a clinical trial is planned, from the design stage to the till the end of the uh, analysis stage, Concern is uh, more uh, concern and the priority should be given for the safety, even though a very minor adverse effect is happening. Uh, so this is my uh, summary about this uh, clinical trials. Thank you for patiently uh, listening. I may exceed at the time. Sorry. Thank you, Rajeshwari. It was an excellent presentation on the phases of clinical trials. Really, you have really told the types and most of the things I know it was the parallel trials crossover. What is this okay. factorial, uh, factorial design? What is this uh, type of this RCT? What is this factorial design? Okay, factorial designs, uh, mainly it is used uh, to see the interaction effect. Suppose you have two interventions, individually you can compare. That is inter, uh, intervention uh, A with the control group, intervention B with the control group. When you are interested in the interaction effect, 
let us together intervention a and b what is the effect of that intervention when comparing to the control there we can go with the factorial trial and it can be uh, done in the same trial itself uh surin ma'am please uh, you are uh, input anything unmute ma'am kindly unmute so it was a wonderful lecture in fact i was also listening very carefully <laughs> and the pictorial way in which he had uh, you know depicted it Blinded. was so explanatory it was excellent what she had thank you so i think uh, that is what is needed in these lectures because if you just go randomly without explaining exactly what it is uh, it becomes very difficult for the audience to understand okay so yeah. rajeshwari as everyone knows that the acid is one of the best method for any research so but it has its own drawbacks and limitations so what are the limitation how do you try to overcome in this in acid is uh, limitations in the sense uh, that is based on the uh, different uh, clinical outcomes what you are looking also ma'am it is not we cannot say it is always uh, it is not feasible most of the times it is feasible uh, but uh, what is the outcome you are looking at Uh, the severe adverse outcomes if it is uh, the mortality if you are looking at uh, uh, what is the outcome you are looking at and mainly uh, sometimes uh, uh, cost effectiveness that's the most important trials, yeah that yeah. is very important most of the times people won't be able to get the uh, funds to conduct the trial so sample size mm-hmm. they want to reduce that makes the trial is not that much effective we can reduce the sample size but uh, it won't answer the uh, research question Maybe that is the problem. Yes. Uh, it was a it was a wonderful uh, uh, session. Uh, Ma'am, for what type of studies uh, do you insist on an ethical committee uh, clearance? Is it only for RCT or how is it your practice in your institution? Uh, in our institution, ethical clearance is for all the studies, ma'am. All the studies. All Even the studies. Even if it is a pilot study, you will have a. Yes. Yes. Observational studies, including observational studies, ethical clearance is a must. even for retrospective they say you should yeah say. yes ma'am record based study is also yeah. it is must it is must maybe consent a waiver of consent study, you can no. get yeah if it is only a retrospective study with collection of data also do you submit to the board and get yes. the clearance yes yes, yes ma'am. ma'am yes ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. okay because yeah, there is identification of patient thing uh, will be there ma'am so anything which we don't come in contact with a patient of name or anything you know that okay we have waiver consent but anything anything patient uh, information yes it will be there priya anything priya um it was a great talk very informative um thank you ma'am uh, like you know we learned a lot today thank you so much so you, that i mean yeah i now we know why like you know you have uh, every department is pouncing on uh, dr rajeshwar <laughs> thank you so much rajeshwar accept thank me you, part of this webinar thank you and future we are going to have more webinars with you so <laughs> yeah. as you told confidence in terms p value so it is confidence is more important than p values that everyone should know <laughs> yes, so yes. now most of the articles are asking for confidence in terms other than p values so yes, in future yeah. our talks will include that thank even you so today much. even today i received a comment asking for a uh, confidence interval from the reviewer Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I, I even mean, I got it back. That's so, why. <laughs> thank you so much, Raj. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Go thank you, please. everyone. So we now move on to the next speaker. Dr. Prashant is already here. Can I have his introductory slide, please? Doctor. Yeah, Doctor Prashant Ganeshan is here. Who is um, the professor of medical oncology in Jipma? it's not only is done medical oncology is also got a clinical fellowship in investigational clinical therapeutics um and uh, he is apparent he was the best dm student in 2010 in aims and he's got over 80 original articles uh, welcome dr prashant and he is going to talk to us on a very important topic today on how to analyze a journal article when we are going through it is it comparing apples and oranges or what is it actually that we have to infer and how do you go about uh, suggesting that how to uh, know the information from it over to you dr prashant uh you are muted yes. so you might have to unmute yourself yeah. uh thank you uh, dr priya and thanks to foxy dr chitra uh, for giving me this opportunity to share some of my ideas So in the next thirty uh, minutes or so, we'll just quickly go through how to analyze uh, journal articles, how to interpret journal articles. Uh, so I think uh, 
many of these uh, important issues have been covered wonderfully by uh, Dr. Uh, Rajeshwari in her previous uh, talk. What we're going to see uh, in the next 30 minutes is the application of many things which uh, Dr. Rajeshwari talked about. So I'm going to take you through interpretation of journal club articles, uh, journal articles uh, in the context of a randomized uh, clinical trial. So as we all know, uh, this is mainly for the students. These are the various types of articles uh, that you find in uh, journals. So starting from expert opinions, editorials, case reports, which are considered as the lowest level of evidence because they're just coming from an individual's perspective or, or, or a group of uh, small patients or something like that. Not to discount their importance at all, because uh, we just heard of Rajeshwari and Dr. Chitra talking about it. It is not practically feasible for us to conduct randomized controlled trials to answer every question that we have to answer in medical practice. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there are rare cancers, rare diseases mm -hmm. where we have to rely on case control studies, small case series or even case reports. And this is important information which helps other doctors to guide their practice. So we, we are not discounting the importance of smaller uh, types of studies, but the gold standard uh, the, the the whole uh, kind of platform on which our entire evidence-based medicine lies is on this so-called randomized control trials. So they are very important. And going ahead, uh, many randomized controls are done. We put all this information together and we create systematic reviews. We try to synthesize all the data which comes from three or four randomized trials or ten randomized trials. We do a meta-analysis and try to come with a synthesized uh, uh, output. So that is meta-analysis. So you get more information. And based on all these things, experts can sit together and they come out with evidence-based guidelines which help you in your day-to-day -day practice. These are the various types of articles you will find in a journal. But I would always tell a postgraduate student, if they are going to start off reading articles or reading journal clubs, the first thing to choose is always a beautifully conducted randomized control trial. There is so much you can learn in the way of research methodology, the way an article should be written, a way article should be read from reading a good randomized control trial. So I would always suggest that when you, when as a student, you have to present a journal club, you start with a randomized control trial. Don't go for any other type of article. And that is what we are going to discuss today. And why should residents present and participate in journal club? According to me, the most important academic act activity a student should have is a journal club. It is not the seminar or it is not the case presentation. What in the most important thing is actually the journal club. It helps you to keep up to date. When you present a journal club, it helps you to hone your presentation skills because you have to think it is not just something which is already there in a review article or up to date that you are cut copying and presenting actually. So you have to really think about what you're presenting and do a good job. So it helps you to hone your presentation skills, helps you to keep time, and most importantly, critically appraise evidence. Evidence will keep coming, evidence will keep changing in modern medicine. So it's important for us to learn how to appraise the evidence and apply it to our practice. At any point of time, for the next 20, 30, 40 years in your career, this is the most crucial thing that we, you will do. And if you have this ability to analyze the article and apply it to your practice, this will always keep you in good stead. So this is a very crucial thing. And this is a, just a short, uh, like a kind of a, you know, a template. If you want to present a journal club, this is how I would suggest students to do it. Don't make it too elaborate. Don't make it too long. The, the key thing here is learning how to synthesize everything in 20 to 30 minutes. So this is a rough idea. Background one to two slides, methods four to five slides, results seven to 10 slides. And just give some small um, two to three slides on the discussion by the author itself. But the most important thing is your own critique. You must make an attempt to critique the article. Critique doesn't mean only criticism. What is good? What is bad? What is different? What is your application? So completely analyzing the article. If you make this attempt four or five times, you can see yourself improving. This is a crucial thing. Every journal representation should have two to three slides on the critique of the article. And finally, some conclusion. Just a rough idea. And on the right side, you have the overall, uh, what is the content of a journal, how you should think about it. So let us think of a day-to-day -day situation, how you will go and approach a journal. 
So I'm taking a situation from a cancer situation because that's what I'm comfortable with. A 38-year-old female has come to you with a history of vaginal bleeding. On examination, she has a 3-centimeter growth. Biopsy is commercial carcinoma. Finally, she's diagnosed as stage 2A cervix uh, cancer. So what is the management? So you know from your discussion, you know from your uh, colleagues, from your teachers, the two options of therapy in early stage carcinoma cervix can go with radiation, can go with surgery. And some chemotherapy that comes before the surgery along with the radiation, a lot of confusion still exists. So you want to, oh, okay, what is the literature out there? I should read about it. Or your consultant says, you go read about it, which should be the best way to go about it. So you go and search. And one of the big articles which will uh, jump on you, uh, I will show you in a moment. But this is, the, this is the crux of the matter here. When you do surgery, especially in a young person, you can preserve the sexual function. Addition of chemotherapy is known to improve the outcome. But chemo radiation is a single modality of treatment. After surgery, there's high risk features are there, some high risk factors are there. You end up giving radiation anyway. So this is the equipoise here. Whenever you are doing a clinical trial, when you are doing a randomized control trial, there must be something which you don't know. This is called an equipoise. So based on this equipoise, this trial was conducted, and you find this trial on the when you do a search, you find this trial. So this is comparing neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgery. Versus concurrent chemo radiation. They're exactly the question which is troubling you. And in stage 2, 1B2, 2A or 2B. So again, 2A is there. So this is exactly the answer that you want. So you want to go into this trial and see whether this answers your question also. And uh, to, uh, you know, kind of the icing on the cake is this is a trial which is done in India. Wonderful. So you go. So whenever you read a journal, first thing you have a quick look at the abstract. But again, please, please remember, don't read only the abstract. Can I have a quick look at the abstract? This will give you an idea whether this is of interest for you. Okay. You have a quick look and you say, okay, 18 to 65 years. Okay. This is the inclusion of this. And uh, okay. They looked at disease free survival, which is interesting. And then they found that, okay, the five-year DFS, the chemotherapy plus surgery was 69% and it was 76%. Oh, looks like chemo radiation is slightly better. But let us read some more. Maybe we will get some more information if you read. Okay, this is something of interest to me. I want to read. Okay. So, the first thing you read in a journal article is how to state the problem. Okay. And how to focus on what is the hypothesis of this study. What are you trying to study here and why are you trying to study this? Okay. Why should you read all these things? You are interested only in the uh, results. No? no, it's important to understand where the authors are coming from. What is their perspective. Why have they done this study? Why have they taken the effort? It's important for you to understand. It will also help you in your own understanding, in your own writing, in your own research. The introduction is a very good component of the journal article to read. And some of the introductions are so beautifully written. This is one example of an article where the introduction is so beautifully written. So it gives you a full, it's like reading about cervical cancer treatment completely in two or three paragraphs. You can see here, they say the radiotherapy is primary modality of treatment, although definitive surgery can also be performed in these two. So there is an equipoise. So straight away they are bringing the matter here. So there is an equipoise. You don't know which is working. The next paragraph, they are discussing what are the advantages and disadvantages of radiation treatment. One paragraph. Next paragraph, what are the advantages and disadvantages of chemotherapy and surgery and cervix cancer? So that is summarized. So see how the authors are nicely bringing the whole concept in one or two paragraphs. And then they are saying that because we do not know which is better, both has its advantages and disadvantages. Hence, there is a clear-cut rationale, a clear-cut equipoise for conducting a randomized control. So it is clear now, this is the reason they are doing the randomized control. Okay, you want to answer the question, which is better. Now, if you want to answer a question, you must have the right method. So this is clinical equipoise, which permits the ethical basis for conducting a randomized control trial. Remember, in a randomized control trial, two separate individuals or two separate patients are going to get two different things. So both must be equally justified. You cannot uh, do something which is inferior, something which is superior. So that is not ethically correct. Both have to be equal. So this equality is called equipoise. You must really not know which is better. Only the trial can answer which is better. So that is called the equipoise and that is what is required. Okay. So now we go to the methods. So the methods have to be constructed in a way which will answer the question. The question here is which disease-free survival is better, whether it is with chemoradiation or surgery followed by 
uh, I mean, chemotherapy followed by surgery. Okay. So the first thing is to choose the right population of patients. Okay. So this is what you're going to do. And before that, they have also, uh, they're also going to talk about how they got the ethics approval and all those things. Okay. So they looked at ECOG performance status of uh, one women of 18 to 65 years, so and so and so, so stage. And there'll be a lot of other uh, inclusion exclusion criteria. Most of the good uh, journal articles will give a supplement where they will give the full details of their inclusion exclusion criteria. So that is also mentioned. If you want to get a full, full impact of the study, it is a good idea to go to the data supplement and look at the complete protocol itself, which will be given for many of these clinical trials published in good journals. So next is the intervention and how the analysis is done. Okay. And this also tells when you look at the inclusion exclusion criteria, it also tells whether the results are applicable to your patient, what question that you are asking, whether the trial is directly applicable to the patient. The next thing is how the random assignment has been done. So again, just now Dr. Rajeshwari told you what's the importance of allocation concealment, blinding and stratification. A good article should describe all these things. So as you can see here, the block design with a block size of four, the random assignment was done by so and so person, Patients were stratified according to this, 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 so that they ensure that equal numbers are represented in both arms. And the study investigators and patients were not blinded to the treatment allocation. So blinding is there or not there should be clearly mentioned. Blinding is desirable in a randomized clinical trial. Blinding is not always possible in a randomized trial. If you're giving two drugs, it is possible to do blinding. Here, one arm is surgery, one arm is radiation. It is not possible to blind the patients or the investigators in such kind of interventions. So, but still they have clearly mentioned that. Allocation concealment, the reason for that, you've already seen. Blinding, the reason for that, you cannot, you've already seen. Simply put, allocation concealment prevents the bias when the patient enters into the trial and blinding is to prevent bias when you're assessing the patient on the trial. So this is a very simplistic way of putting what is the difference between allocation concealment and blinding. Certification we have already seen. So whether the need for certification is there, that depends on the trial. So in this trial, they have done stratification based on some of the factors which might confound the results. So if you don't do stratification, what might happen is if there is over representation of stage 1B in the one of the arms, then that arm might Seemingly you do better because you have included more patients of a lesser stage. So to prevent this anomaly, which can come sometimes, even though you're randomizing a large number of patients. So to prevent that anomaly, you're doing stratification. So this study mentions that they have stratified based on one or two factors, two or three factors, which they think, which they think may confirm the results. Next, they will describe the procedures. So there is arm A and arm B. Here they've clearly described, okay, if they are going to arm this is the neurological chemotherapy they received. This is how they have done the survey. In arm B, this is arm B, this is how the radiation was delivered along with the concurrent chemotherapy. So, whether what we are looking is okay, this is how they have done the chemotherapy, paclitaxel carboplatin. Is that the correct uh, chemotherapy to be given in uh, CS service? They have done surgery. Okay, this is the type of surgery they have done. This is the correct, correct type of surgery to be done in CS service. Concurrent chemo radiation is given. Is this the correct dose uh, to be given? Is this the standard of care which the patients have received? These are the things that you should see or learn when you look at the procedure section of uh, the uh, of the trial. This also tells the applicability. So this is what they have done. Is this something which is going to be applicable for my setting? So this is what you can see when you are uh, extrapolating the data for your clinical practice. Okay, then they have also told. In patients in arm A, if they have undergone surgery, if these, these, these things are there, they will get additional radiation because we already know that some high risk features are there after cervix surgery, you have to give additional radiation. So this also they have described in the, in the trial, you cannot leave it to chance. So they have clearly described if these are there, they are going to get radiation so that everything is controlled from the beginning. That's why we are calling this a randomized controlled trial. Everything is controlled in a randomized controlled trial. Okay, so that the answer is clearly answered. If you don't clearly uh, control everything, then at the end, you cannot interpret the answer correctly. Okay, so then you have the end points. Whenever you do a trial, there are certain end points that you are going to look at, which is of importance for you. Okay, so end point will be something like disease-free survival, overall survival, response rate, 
progression to survival. Various endpoints are there. Okay. Depending on what you feel is important for you, that is how you choose the endpoint. In this case, they have taken an endpoint, which is disease-free survival, which seems like a good endpoint in a trial like this. Okay, because ultimately they should remain disease-free, cured of the disease. That's what you're trying to do. But a more robust endpoint also in a cancer trials maybe the overall survival because ultimately you want people to live longer. The disease is cured, you want them to live longer. So that is also a reasonable endpoint. So I'm not going to go into the details of how to choose endpoints, but this is something which you have to think about when you come to this area of the methodology. Okay. And then there are some descriptions called primary endpoint and secondary endpoint. Imagine the primary endpoint, simply put, is the most important thing in a clinical trial based on which you are calculating the sample size, based on which you will decide whether the trial is failure or success. If the primary endpoint, you say that I am going to improve disease-free survival by this, if it doesn't achieve the improved disease-free survival, the trial is considered as a negative trial. You did not demonstrate what you tried to demonstrate. It's a negative trial. Okay. Even if the secondary endpoints are successful, if the primary endpoint is negative, it is still a negative trial. But you can also say in the secondary endpoint, this, 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 I found. Okay. There are some other endpoints like hypothesis generating endpoint, which you may just suddenly find, which you may not know. Okay, what are the implication at this point of time? I did this trial, but suddenly I found that among uh, okay uh, among people who are recruited from this hospital, this uh, chemo radiation did not work. Oh, okay. So this is something which you found, but that is not your primary intent. That may have so many reasons for that uh, for a particular observation. You may just find that observation and you may just state that observation. But that is not your primary aim or primary endpoint of your trial. These kind of things which you incidentally find are called hypothesis generating, which is interesting, which may lead out to future trials or future thinking on why that particular observation came out. Okay. Now, uh, the trial is usually powered to detect the primary endpoint. Secondary endpoint can be anything. You can have like 10 different secondary endpoints, response rate, QOL, PFS, RFS, OS, any kind of secondary endpoint is permissible, which is you think is relevant okay the statistical component of a clinical trial again these are some of the areas which when i've seen when residents want to present a journal club they tend to skip over these areas because most of the time they don't understand it okay but let me tell you put some effort try to understand this this is the learning part okay so you don't find an easy way and try to skip over this portion Please spend some effort, try to understand this. Nowadays, wonderful videos are available in YouTube, plenty of resource materials in the net, which can help you to understand some of these terminologies, which is used in the statistical section of a clinical trial. Okay. So again, these are, these are good ways to learn on what assumptions they have used to make the sample size, what kind of statistical tests have been used, are they acceptable, okay? Another important thing in many clinical trials is something called a subgroup analysis, okay? So this is something you will see, and uh, I, will, I will talk a little bit uh, more on that. So the preliminary concepts in RCTs is the first thing which will be presented is the baseline characteristics. Here, what we want to see is that the control group, intervention group should be broadly similar, if the randomization has worked, they should be similar. There may be one or two things which may, just by chance, they may be different. Whether the sample size calculation is accurate, whether the power calculation is accurate, and whether the intention to treat principle has been used when they are looking at the outcome. Again, Dr. Rajeshwari talked about it. This is something which you have to specifically see how kind of analysis was done, whether it's an intention to treat analysis or whether it's a per protocol analysis. This kind of trials it can happen. You may, you may randomize a patient to surgery arm. But when the patient went to the doctor, the patient has a change of mind. I said, no, no, I don't want surgery. I want only chemo radiation. Now, you don't have an option. Whatever the patient says, you have to do. You cannot force the patient that I have randomized you to surgery. No, you should have surgery. No, that is unethical. So, you have to give chemo radiation for the patient. But for the purpose of the trial, you have to analyze him as if he got surgery. This kind of analysis is intention to treat analysis. Okay. And this will happen. There will be 5% of patients or 2% of patients where this crossover, this interchange or this kind of uh, mixing up may happen when you're treating uh, thousands of patients, this kind of things might happen. Okay. So this is per protocol and intention to treat. Okay. There are reasons for this. Again, I'm not going into it, but this is something which you have to look at when you're looking at a journal article. Now we come to the results section. Okay. So the baseline characteristics table, very important. What you should see here? whether their population is similar to what I see in the clinic. Then only the data is applicable to you. Okay. 
you look at a cl- uh, trial article and you find the median age is uh, 70 years whereas in your clinic the median age is 40 years or 50 years then that data is not directly applicable to you so you must keep that in mind when you are interpreting journal articles if you find in a in, in an article most of the patients are of stage uh, uh, one and two but in your practice you are seeing all stage three patients again that is not directly applicable to you so this is what you have to see first thing in the baseline characteristics okay and what are the other striking things which may be looking oh okay this is this is totally different this is very interesting in radiologically this many nodes are positive oh we don't see that that many nodes positive so these kind of things should strike you when you go through the baseline characteristics next is usually something called a consort diagram okay this is a visual representation of the entire trial so this gives a lot of interesting information so in this study you can see that they screened 1713 patients for eligibility and as you can see thousand patients have been excluded okay so that means when you sit in the clinic okay very few patients less than maybe what is it like 30 40 percent of patients are actually eligible to go into the trial so those patients only this information which is coming from this trial is going to apply most of them are not eligible many of them decline to participate this is a challenge in especially in india because people are very wary when you tell clinical trials they don't want to participate many of them are unreliable for follow-up so this is the practical problem that you face when you're conducting clinical trials so ultimately, they randomized 635, 317 here, 318 here. Okay, then they have described how many were lost to follow up and how many were included in the. So, so this this gives you a visual representation of what happened in the clinical trial. And then they describe the primary endpoint, which is the DFS. And this is like a survival endpoint with a time to event. So that has been described with these what we call as kaplan mayer curves, which are very common in oncology uh, journals. Uh, and in other, other situations also, you may use uh, time to even endpoints, especially when you are calculating something like overall survival. So, here you can see very simple representation. The yellow thing is better than the blue thing. Okay, and the statistics corresponding to that, the confidence intervals have been shown here, the p value is shown here, so we know that it's statistically significant. So, the yellow one, that is the CTRT, is superior to NACT plus surgery in terms of the disease person. This is the primary analysis of the study. Okay, this is the primary information that you get. Now you look at the secondary analysis, subgroup analysis. Okay, subgroup analysis, what are you going to do? You are taking these subgroups, stage 1B, 2A, and B. Okay, and then you are looking at whether CTRT is better or neoadjuvant chemotherapy is better. Okay, and then you are calculating the hazard ratio for each of these things. As you can see, okay, in 2B, maybe CTRT is better. In 1B and 2A, oh, it is right on 1. So maybe there is no much difference. In, in Okay. Then you look at the hemoglobin. Okay. It is slightly here, but it is touching the line here. The confidence interval is touching the line here. Too. You cannot interpret anything more. If you see the lymph node status, if you have more uh, negative lymph nodes, then maybe CTRT is better. If you have positive lymph nodes, oh, both are okay. So like that, you can make some interpretations from the subgroup analysis, but the most important caveat here is the subgroup analysis is to be used only for some hypothesis generation. It can help you in some clinical decision making, but you should never take it as the, you know, the final value here. The final interpretation of the study should be that CTRT is superior to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgery. This can only, okay, maybe some suggestion is there that most of the benefit of CTRT is for 2B. Maybe 1B2 and 2A, I can still consider NACT plus surgery. But again, remember, this is not the primary result of the study. If at all you want to prove it, ideally, you should do another trial with only 1B2 and 2A and do this whole thing again and then prove it. Okay, that may or may not be practically feasible. So that is why we still hold on to the subgroup analysis. But subgroup analysis is still subgroup analysis. It is not the main result of the study. But it is interesting to know because it answers some questions which may not be always answerable. Okay. And remember, there are some rules in subgroup analysis. As far as possible, it should be pre-specified. Even when you are starting the trial, you should say that I am going to look at stage hemoglobin, lymph nodes and eco performance status at the completion of the study to see whether these are important or not. So this is pre-specified. I have already decided what I am going to test. 
Sometimes you should you do everything and then you okay, let us test this also. Test this also. And then 10 or 15 things you keep on testing. What will happen? By chance, one of them will cost you. And then you will say that in this subgroup, this is better. So this is not acceptable. Okay. This is a very nice article in Ethereum some 10, 15 years back, which will clearly tell you what are the perils of doing this kind of random subgroup analysis. That should never be done. Okay. And the result should be interpreted cautiously. These are considered hypothesis generating because there is high chance of false positivity. So remember this. This is very commonly done in randomized control trials. You must know what is the importance of the subgroup analysis. Now we come to the secondary endpoints. Remember the subgroup analysis is done for the primary endpoint. You are looking at various subgroups with respect to how they performed uh, in terms of the primary endpoint. Now we are coming to the secondary endpoint. So how many patients died? What is the overall surveillance? So if you look at this data here, you will say that five-year overall survey is 75%, 74%. There is not much of uh, difference. The p-value is 0.87. So they can conclude that whatever you do this way or that way, survival is not going to be different. So that is the interpretation that you can make. The other uh, aspects of an RCT. So this is regarding the trial outcome. Those important things have come. Next is how the how did how did it go? How did the RCT perform? Were they able to deliver in most people whatever they plan to deliver? Were there any problems in the delivery of their care? So this kind of information may be given in a good RCT. So here they will say, okay, concurrent chemo radiation. What proportion of patients got all five planned cycles? How many got the only three cycles? When you give your given chemotherapy or plan for three cycles, how many of them got three cycles? How many of them got two cycles and one cycle? How many of them actually did not receive the new chemotherapy at all? They might have got only surgery. So all these things will happen. This is the way of stating all these things. How many of them required dose reduction? How many of them required dose reduction in the concurrent chemo reduction? So this kind of information is presented. And what kind of surgery was done? Okay, all this information will come. And similarly, the adverse events. Another very important component. What are the adverse events? You know, what are the great three, four adverse events which are generally more severe or even like so you can compare between the grade 3 for adverse events of each category between this arm and that arm. Okay, very important thing for you when you are applying these results in practice. You must know what to expect. Okay, and some of these adverse events are persisting beyond the three months or beyond two years. Again, that information is also available. So this is, this is all characteristics of a good study where they have a long follow up. They have maintained the information for a long time and they're presenting each and everything so that so you can rely on this data and make some proper. Final part of this is the discussion. The authors usually will summarize their key finding, give their perspectives, and they will also explain inconsistent results or unexpected results. So reading the discussion portion gives you a lot of insights because they will discuss many other studies and say how this study is different, why it is different. Okay. So a very uh, good understanding of the subject can come when you read the discussion portion of any good journal article. And finally, you should come to your own discussion of critics and don't forget, whenever you are reading a journal article, this acknowledgement is not taken from this particular article. This is just to show you that they will tell whether the study was funded by some pharmaceutical company, whether the funding, funding was from some other agency, whether there was any conflict for the, any of the authors. So not to put down a study just because some of the authors have got funding from pharmaceutical industries, but you should be aware that there is a potential source of bias. So you have to just keep in mind. So you should read that portion of a journal article. Also. Now, finally, how do you apply this evidence in practice? You read through, read through this journal. Again, you have a 38-year-old female, which we discussed before. She comes and tells that she actually desires the preservation of sexual function. But at the same time, she wants the best cure rate. Right? So what will you do? You should also, of course, not read only one study. You should also look at similar trials, probably look at some synthesis of data, look at the guidelines of the thing. But again, here is where sometimes the subgroup analysis can help you. So I would deal with the situation by telling the patient that, see, the standard is to give chemo radiation. But however, if you desire, Probably, if you can do surgery or chemotherapy, you are probably going to get a similar kind of result. We can just infer that and you can try that. So, this kind of interpretation you can give and talk to the patient more confidently only if you have read the full article. If you read only the abstract, you will have to go with only 
before revision. This is the reason I tell you read the full journal article and then you can apply much better uh, thing for your patient. Okay. So read the full article. Try to have some basic statistical background. Again, good, good courses are available. Very simplified videos are available to explain statistical concepts to you which are available in your uh, in, in the internet at this point of time. Okay. Or if you, you can you can even use some tools like chat GPT now. If you put some question of this sort, it gives you a very nice simplified explanation. You can even uh, you know query something like chat GPT to simplify things further for you and it does that actually. So you should all all students should try that. It's a good uh, learning resource that way because you can keep talking to it uh, like you can. It's a, like a good uh, chatting kind of uh, software. So I think you should also try that. Repeated practice. First time in your journal club, it can be very, you know, uh, it can be intimidating even. But you should keep practicing. I'm sure all of you will keep getting better. And that's the way to learn. And uh, important, don't skip through the methodology and statistics section. This is something which uh, commonly many of the uh, those students do. And finally, you have to apply uh, what you have read, either in the management of the patient or in your own research activities. So that's all I have for you today. Uh, it's a, uh, just a quick overview. I just uh, used uh, one of the journal articles as a prop. I'm sorry if it is all heavily on uh, cancer, uh, but I'm sure the principles are uh, same and can be applied to uh, any of the fields or branches of uh, medicine. Thank you for your time. And as I always say, please enjoy three years of your residency. Again, I'm hoping and that I'm mostly talking to residents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Prashant. That was a very nice uh, uh, presentation of how to go about, even though your thing was a lot on onco, it's okay. It was still on cervical onco, so it was all right with us. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from the audience, from the experts who are here? And if there are any questions from the audience, we would like to take it. I think we missed one question from the uh, for the previous talk from, the, from an audience. So... Um, Actually, uh, one audience have asked like uh, sample size. Is it necessary to calculate the sample size or uh, should we only will calculate the sample size? I mean, they themselves want to calculate the sample size or should we approach the statistician always? I told it's better you approach the statistician. Mm. Oh, the Prajishri is here. Good. Yes, uh, yes then uh, it is our job now to decide that. <laughs> yeah, there was also, I think Anantalakshmi has asked another question. Uh, randomization has to be done when we enroll patients after enrollment. Stratification is done to allot in each group. Is that correct? Please clarify. Uh, no, I think uh, you confused with this uh, stratification and randomization. Uh, after enrollment, you are going to do a randomization. Randomization, different techniques are there. Either you are going to use a block randomization or stratified randomization. So that is different. But after enrollment only, you are going to do the randomization. Not a stratification separate and randomization separate. They are the same. Um, there's the same. Uh, Anantalakshmi has asked another question. Do Does a case report need an IEC clearance? Uh, yes, uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. It, uh, it, it, it entirely depends on the journal. Mm -hmm. Most journals do not bother. Okay. But there are some journals who have asked us for an IEC uh, approval even for case reports. In that case, it's the same thing because most of the time case reports do not identify any patients. You just have to take it the, to the IGC and they will give you an approval. It's, it's just an additional process, but it entirely depends on journals actually. So if they ask, you will have to do that. Otherwise, you don't have to bother. Are there any more questions? Uh... No, no there from, are, actually, I just want to thank, uh, I mean, uh, Prashant. Prashant, when you are reading the articles, so we never thought so many points are there which we have to analyze. We just see the abstract, we see the conclusion, yes, it's feasible or not. But your <laughs> analysis done article, I think so we have to read some 50 articles to come to that conclusion. Thank you for in-depth presentation. Thank you. I think uh, your presentation was excellent. I got busy on the phone, but I did go through the whole presentation and it, it's, it was really very, very good. It sorted out some of my queries also. <laughs> yeah, ma'am is one of the best investigator in Jipper, and lot of external grant in Crows goes to him. He is one like, investigational, uh, what do you call marriage? Anything, any problem? We just rest to Prashant. Yeah, bringing so, lot of I laurels to Jipper. 
Yeah. We do the same faculty to various uh, states. Do it with other state chapters with the same faculty. Yeah, faculty. we should. Yeah, we yeah, can yeah. have the uh, inter chapter. So simply explained, so lovely, no hi fi thing. I, it was beautiful. That's why I booked Prashant and Rajeshwari for all our webinar series. Wherever we want to just call. Yeah, them. please do it with everybody, all the states. Yes, yes, I'm surely we'll interact and we'll show. That's we'll a, that's a great idea, Sarveen. I think Pondicherry can take it up with Karnataka, South Tamil Nadu, everyone yes. for this. I think it's something we can do nationally for all chapters because everyone needs to know these basics for us. Now, yeah. yeah, now India is coming up more in research. First, we were depending on other international uh, country. I mean, international. Oh, I need to know. correct you, Chitra. India is coming up. With more quality research. Yes, yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> so we need to have a good. I mean, now many people started asking questions like, should we canter sample size? But never we have asked before anyone who is ask about sample size, how to calculate yeah. IC clearance. So I it's mean, nicely opening doors of many of the delegates. Like research, so before we did it, but now we are doing it properly. Yeah, and that's why this this kind of a thing is the need of the art. The younger lot, they want to know. Even the older lot wants to know where we are going wrong, how we should have done it. So yes, true, true. Chitra, do take it across to sure, sure, ma'am. I'll interact with others also. With uh, yeah. IFS. And for every state chapter, this is very good. Yeah, ma'am. <laughs> so we'll continue with the web. I mean, uh, this webinar series for a long time because there's lot of topics in research should be discussed. So we'll go on, including the other state chapters also. So they express across all over India. That's what our uh, main and, motive. Uh, you know, uh, because this is general, you can involve your proxy societies also, the nearby proxy. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think in collaboration we can do, madam. It is spread to the lot number of people. You can also That's do it with the postgraduates. Yeah. Mm. Especially this, uh, uh, what do you call? Uh, they are the one future researchers. So yes. we had to create a research interest. And they need to do it right from their uh, dissertation, right? Yeah, dissertation they'll do it up, but future whenever they go, no, they are the ones. They make the dissertations good so that it continues. No, because the guide helps you, you don't even think and you keep doing ah, okay. it. Uh, guide do and satisfaction. <laughs> when you have to do it on your own, you can't do it. True, true, true man. That's true. That's true. So we've had a great two topics going and a great uh, discussion as well. With that, we come to the end of today's program. And I request uh, our coordinator for today, Dr. Indumati Joy, to sum up the program and give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Priya. Uh, just a yes, minute. Yes, Indumati, we can hear you, but we are unable to see you. Oh, one minute, one minute. Just give me a second. Uh, there's some little problem with my. No problem. We can hear you. You can just go ahead, I guess. Okay. So I would like to thank the IFS Tamil Nadu and the IFS Pondicherry chapter for such a lovely, wonderful program. I would also like to thank uh, President Dr. K.D. Nair and the Secretary Dr. Surveen. And uh, Dr. Surveen uh, has graced the uh, evening today. Thank you so much, ma'am. And also, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Priya Kannan and Dr. Raj Priya. And uh, also, Dr. Chitra Tyagaraju and Dr. Kubera. And uh, uh, Rajeshwari, ma'am, your talk was wonderful. I think uh, most of the postgraduates would have been... Uh, they, uh, actually, they pick up a topic, but they won't know how to go about with that. And uh, Dr. Prashant was really an excellent uh, presentation. And he took the subject of cervical cancer which is also a very important topic being uh, being an OBG person, it will be very useful for all the PGs. I, I have actually posted this in many of the fellows and the postgraduate candidates. I hope they have made use of it. Yeah. And as uh, Dr. Surbin was telling, we have to combine this with the other state chapters and take it through because many of the private hospitals, they do a, a lot of uh, good work, but uh, they uh, once they complete the... Uh, MD course or they finish the fellowship where uh, a dissertation is a must. So they have the facility of making use of a guide and they do everything. But what happens is once they pass out, then they just join somewhere and they stop doing the studies. That is why Indians do a lot of good work, but unfortunately they don't publish much. I think by 
by propagating this kind of a program we have to bring that awareness among the young generation like how dr chitra told so that uh, we'll have more papers to present and then uh, the future can be much better i thank each and every one of the delegates who have taken part and also the uh, the other students who have taken part in this thank you very much ma'am thank you Thank you, Sunil Ma'am, for joining us and seriously being a part of this. Thank you, Sunil Ma'am, for joining us. I really enjoyed the program. I was out for a little bit in the middle because I was getting calls, but I really enjoyed the program. Thank you. Thank you, and th thank you, and I thank MQ thank also you. for uh, yeah. for the platform. Thank you so much, Nako. Thank you, Ma'am. Uh, Thank you, Prashant. Thank you, Rajesh. Happy to happy Thank to you, share Rajesh. with you all that more than one fifty uh, members, delegates, they they have joined. Very it was good. Very wonderful good. session. Yeah. Lot of insights they have got, and thanks for giving us opportunity to host this uh, IFS event. Yeah, we'll be Thank having you. next webinar on twenty eighth of this month, Friday. So we'll tell you the yes, topics again. We'll yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye, Thank Priya. You. Thank, you Thank you once you again. Cool. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Madan. Thank you, Indra, ma'am. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thanks, Madan, for coordinating, uh, coordinating everything. Yeah. And uh, Nakul, please don't forget to send the number and uh, the yeah. link if you have for the same two. Yeah, send the recordings. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye, Chitra. Yeah, Nira.